today on Exploring Scotland's History, we're going to dip into some of the traditional tales, tragic stories and long-standing myths surrounding the Outer Hebrides. Never be tempted to walk through these sands between South Euston and Bimbecula when the tide's out. They're quicksand. Many years ago a girl attempted this and ended up dying a very slow, slow death as she slowly drowned as the tide came in and her misery was compounded by the fact that it was an eight hour experience. Fun fact. Go for it. There's a film, an independent film called Limbo. Yeah. And it was filmed on both North and South East and it's about immigrants and they employed immigrants to do the whole film. Oh, cool. Just thought you'd like to know. Oh, oh it's that the one that's about the Syrian immigrants? Yeah. Ah, right. I've not seen it, but I quite want to watch it. There you go. You yeah. know where you'll recognise places when you watch <laughs> it now. It'll be like going on holly bags yeah. again. Add that to the list of films I've not seen. There you go. Interesting story about the Eust. You know the guy Martin Martin that has like documented an awful lot of things about life on the islands and mm. stuff like that. He mentioned an otter king. Um, he described it as a much larger than usual otter and it had white markings on its breast and it was always seen with seven regular sized otters but apparently the pelt from this otter had magical properties to it. Oh right, okay. That's it. That, that's it. There's a magic otter out there called the Otter King. The yep. magic coat. Yep. Oh, what? What? what, <laughs> what? Have you ever had dulse soup? Dulse soup? No. Yeah. Now, I like dulse. Dulse is a big thing on the north coast of Ireland, but I've never had dulse soup. But dulse over here is classed as the bacon of the sea. And they make the soup with obviously dulse and some milk and butter and some black pepper and the local ladies say that it tastes so good that you'll eat your fingers off after you've had it. Seaweed soup? Yeah. I'll pass. I'd rather just have bacon. Cows were highly revered on Cows. the islands as well, yes. Um, the diet was a lot of butter and cream. Mm -hmm and um, the cows would be tethered, their legs would be tethered with, it's a Gaelic word, burach. Um, it's like a, like a, nearly like a sort of rope tie mm -hmm. when they were being milked so that they couldn't like kick out either the milk and maid or obviously yeah. the milk. Um, and then these, on these islands, because a lot of tasks they did were quite arduous and quite laborious they all had songs for them um, and they do have a song about a cow with a silk burk. Um the cows were so revered they made it a silk rope yes. to tie its legs together while they milked it yes they must have been a lot of time in their hands up here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angus John where did I just check? Campbell yes he was a Campbell um, a he was there? yes. <laughs> oh well, there was a camp buried in one of the graves. Like somewhere buried, there. yeah. <laughs> Next to the McDonald's. But like I say, this guy Campbell, he was a local ferryman, and he had lots of stories about magical cows. Oh, there's a buzzard. Um, <laughs> um, he had lots of stories about these magical cows that would come out of the sea, and. Um, basically come on land and then to farms for good and also to the detriment of people. I think at one time you were discussing how the Monarch Islands were owned by Iona. Yeah. Obviously we went to Iona and there was a lot of myth and surrounding Iona as as well as the religious side of things. Yeah. That's the same for the Monarch Islands. Mm -hmm. um, sea Kelpies are about the Monarch Islands quite a lot apparently 
and in years gone by people would have sent out their prize bull into the sea to sort out the sea kelpie and would have lost both the sea kelpie and the cow the bull because they would have both got in into the sea and not come back out again okay the monarch islands as well mm -hmm. there's a world war one grave on them right yeah a very random world war one grave i haven't researched it because i knew we weren't uh, going to get out of the monarch islands i, th I thought they were uninhabited they've been uninhabited for i'm wondering was it maybe somebody lost at sea uh, and that was the closest island that they took uh, them to I, I don't know uh, possibly yeah but yeah, that's, that's something yeah. to research and find out some information yeah. on. And then they can go to the Monarch Islands. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to excuse the midgy hat. It's a hat and it's raining as usual. This is Loch and Eileen and three friends were walking past the lock one night when they found an illuminated dog. It was the size of a collie, had a very small head and no eyes. It disappeared just as it got up to them and when they went home their old aunt said that it was a Kusith, a fairy dog and apparently they're rife in these parts. Benbecula is also known for the Blobster. Um, there was a creature washed up on one of the beaches in Bambacula um, in 1990. It was four meters long and, and it had like diamond shaped fins on its back and to this date it hasn't been identified yet. Yeah this is Barvis Moor. It just goes for miles. The big mirror. Stories know. about the mirror. Yeah, stories yes. about it as usual. This mirror is well known because there's ghost cars. Ghost cars? Yes, ghost cars. Not just ghosts, ghost cars. Right, okay. There's a story of a lot of people heading up and down the mirror and um, see car headlights. Uh -huh. And then when they actually get alongside the car headlights, the lights and the alleged car disappear. Right. Right. But there was a minister who was heading over this moor and he saw car headlights and when they came up to him they disappeared. Right. Uh -huh. So he was driving on and he looked in his rear view mirror and he saw the tail lights. I'm getting eaten by midges by the way. Huh? Saw the tail lights of the skin's car. Skin so soft, each skin so soft. Quite skin so soft all. He was heading away and he saw the tail lights of the car. Uh -huh. So we turned around and he followed the tail lights and the tail lights of the car ended up in one of the ditches. Uh -huh. So he stopped the car uh -huh. and went out to see whether this person was okay who had driven into the ditch. And when he got up to the car, the tail lights disappeared and the car disappeared again. Right. The strange thing is, uh -huh. two weeks later, an actual car ended up in that same ditch. Oh, right. So it's a very, very spooky mirror. So. So there's a ghost or something that hasn't actually happened yet? Right, okay. Actually, if you look along here, this is really, really good turf country. I saw the ridges over the yeah. other side. Well, peat. 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 Turf. You people. Turf. 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 Irish. Irish, yeah. But it's a very, very desolate area. Uh, oh, it's massive, the way I'm wrong. It is really oh. massive. And really filled with midges. Can right, we go can we back, back to, to the, the car? car? Yeah, back to the car. Now we will tell you about the Shant Islands, a group of islands that sit in the Minch and the Gaelic translation of their name means Enchanted Islands and I think we'll probably see why. The geology of the Shants is that they're actually an extension of the Trotternish Peninsula uh, which you leave on sky in the boat on your way over to Harrison Lewis. The Giant's Causeway and the Isle of Staffa have similar dolerite columns on them as Garve Eileen, which is one of the Shant Islands. 
until recent years they were one of the few islands who still had a colony of black rats, ratus, ratus. It is thought as they had come off a ship years and years before. In 2016, Wildlife Management International Limited exterminated all the rats. It was part of a bigger plan to save seabirds in the area. The Shant Island Seabird Recovery Programme, I would imagine, was a success. The Shant Islands now provide nesting places for 10% of the UK puffins and 7% of the UK razorbills, as well as being able to hold guillemots, kittiwakes, shags and fulmer. The project clearly was a success. The RSPB reported the first ever storm petrel chick crying in one of the crevasses on the islands. Hopefully, with figures like that, this will just increase. It is a fantastic bird sanctuary. It is so remote that these animals will be safe. There is a traditional story surrounding the Shant Islands. A shepherd and his wife were living on Garv Eileen. Macaulay was thought to be his name. They didn't have a Christian name. Obviously, he would farm the land and fish and she would actually go down the cliffs and trap seabirds for their feathers and also for their meat. Now, she trapped them by their beaks and tied a rope around their neck and tied that to her waist. The story goes that one day she was out catching her seabirds and she fell from the cliffs into the sea. She had so many birds attached to her waist that she floated off the sea and her husband could do nothing about it. Another more modern story is from 1946 when two young ladies were invited to weekend over on the island. They lasted a night. The noise of the rat activity had them nearly demented. To compound matters, their host had not tied their dinghy upright and it had been crushed on the rocks. He had to swim out to their main boat bring back a line and the two young ladies in their summer print florals had to swim to the boat in order to get home. A year later, those two ladies would become the current Queen Elizabeth's bridesmaids. Now we do hit the realms of tradition and myth and magic. It is said that the Storm Kelpies, or the Blue Men of Minch as they're called, wintered on the Shant Islands. They were always keeping a keen eye out for any sailors in trouble or especially boats in trouble that they could sink. Traditional tales suggest that they were a third of a tribe of fallen angels, the other two thirds comprising of land dwelling fairies and merry dancers which were the fairies that allegedly brought forward the northern lights. The stretch of water between the Shant Islands and the Trotternish Peninsula is known as the current of destruction. They have lost so many men and so many boats on that stretch of water. Donald Mackenzie wrote of the Blue Men of Minch. He said they would converse with sailors in Gaelic, reciting a line of a poem, and if the sailor did not answer quickly enough, he would perish. Mackenzie wrote of a conversation between the chief of the Storm Kelpies, often referred to as Shoney, and an ancient mariner. Shoney. Man of the black cap, what do you say, as your proud ship cleaves the brine? The skipper. My speedy ship takes the shortest way, and I'll follow you line by line. Shoney. My men are eager, my men are ready to drag you below the waves. The skipper. My ship is speedy, my ship is steady, and if it sank, it would wreck your caves. The quick actions of the ancient mariner left Shoney defeated and him and the rest of the Blue Men went back to their underwater caves in the Shant Island. Mackenzie's research for the Blue Men had included the Annals of Ireland and go back to Harold Fairhair, the first North King. He believed the Blue Men could have even referred to maroon slaves abandoned on the Shants by the Vikings. An alternative explanation refers to the Pictish people who are said to have favoured painting themselves blue. It is clear to see why the Shant Islands are translated to Enchanted. Enchanted indeed they are. <laughs>